Please be seated. And pray with me as we now prepare our hearts and minds for the receiving of God's word proclaimed. Let us pray. Loving God, what we know not, but need to know, help us to learn. What we have not, but in truth need, grant us what you desire. God, what we are not, but should be, help us to become by the power of your Holy Spirit, and to the glory of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture today, at least portion of it in Mark, is commonly referred to as the story of the widow's might. It is the lectionary uh, passage this week, and most of you know I, I tend to like being a, a lectionary preacher, taking, walking through the, the, the Bible every year. Yeah, I'm a lectionary preacher, except when I'm not. But today, this lectionary passage, I thought, really could speak to us. As most of you are aware, this text is often used in the context of stewardship, as it offers what is obviously a perfect appeal, a perfect understanding of sacrificial giving. But there are other essential biblical and theological principles at play in this text in Mark that we often just simply overlook. In some ways, perhaps like many of you, I had to unhear what is the typical gospel message of stewardship in, in this pericope, in this section of Mark. And I did so confident that the Holy Spirit would provide a new or at least a different, perhaps a refocused uh, interpretation of God's Word to us this day. Mark's gospel depicts the pilgrimage of obedience and certain death that eventually led Jesus to Jerusalem, where Jesus was received by loud hosannas as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And like all of the faithful pilgrims before him, Jesus, upon entering the, the holy city, made his way to the temple where sacrifice was offered to God. The location of this incident, endearingly referred to as the, the story of the widow's might, obviously takes place somewhere close, if not in the woman's court, of the massive temple complex where, where Jesus had positioned himself to observe the people either passing by or stopping to make a, a contribution at the treasury located in the women's court. But early this week, as I, as I read this passage, something caught my attention. As I said, I've always perceived this text and applied it as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, as a stewardship text. In my mind's eye, I somehow picture Jesus walking around the temple when this destitute widow walks up to him and, and places her two uh, copper coins worth about uh, a penny into the treasury. She walks up to the treasury and where there is a reception urn, she places her mites into the... Uh, into the treasury. And I've always just pictured this, but that's not exactly what Mark writes. Read verse 41 carefully, because something we so often miss is right there. It says, He, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. The observation here is that Jesus sat down. 
And the observation that Jesus makes then is of no coincidence. He purposely, he purposely sat down. He positioned himself in a strategic location that offered a, a great vantage point to observe the people. This is no minor detail, folks. I, I believe this is biblical evidence that Jesus, full of mercy and full of grace, stops to watch, to to see, to observe both the, the best and the worst in human nature. If Jesus' desire, my friends, is to heal our, our wounds, our spiritual wounds, to, to teach us to address our sin, it was his first desire to walk among us and know us. Notice what Jesus does once he observes the the distinct difference between the destitute widow and the others gathered around the the treasury. He calls his disciples to him and he teaches them the meaning not of abundance, but of abundant gratitude. Jesus focuses the disciples' attention toward the the woman, the, the widow who is full of gratitude and faith. You see, to be a disciple of Christ is to develop a theological eye, a new way of seeing that enables us to focus our attention toward the things that God would have us see and the people, the people that God would not have us overlook. Like this poor widow in the temple. Henry Morrison Flagler was the son of a Presbyterian minister. Despite his rather modest, very modest background growing up in the, in the church's, church's owned man's, Flagler became one of the most prominent citizens in the United States. He is responsible in many ways for opening up the state of Florida for development, building, as I would imagine most of you know, the the railroads and the hotels that once catered to our nation's most influential families, all up and down the east coast of Florida. One of his hotels, the Ponce de Leon in St. Augustine, now serves as a dormitory and a cafeteria for the college that bears his name, Flagler College. There are many outstanding features to this magnificent building. Tiffany windows, murals by George W. Maynard, ceilings painted by Vergola Tajetti of Paris. But one more feature that I found most curious, it's actually the the tile, the mosaic tile floor. Flagler apparently hired skilled laborers from Africa to come to St. Augustine to lay this floor. As visitors and friends would marvel, just absolutely marvel over this floor's distinct and majestic pattern, they would often congratulate Flagler for the floor, for the floor, the floor's absolute beauty and perfection. Perhaps overreacting to their praise, Flagler had a few of the laborers return and get this, actually insert a small flaw at the entrance of the hotel in a pattern unbroken throughout. A small white tile was replaced by a black tile. Unless it's pointed out, most people would never notice. But it allowed Flagler, a staunch Calvinist, okay, I know some of you know the history here, a staunch Calvinist who didn't always act like one, to enter his hotel reminded that perfection in the universe remained with God alone. 
Nothing is perfect but God. He believed this with all his heart. But what a unique personality quirk for such an interesting man of historical significance. Great historical significance. Perfection was obviously important to this, to this barren of, of It's barren of of great significance in our country. He was a a barren of industry. And yet even as he recognized his human limitations, he knew that perfection belonged only to God. Now, This is very interesting because perfection, perfection it would seem is something that many of us, myself included, perfection is something I'm afraid that we too easily dismiss as unattainable. Especially when striving for righteousness. Well, he can never attain perfection. And, and Kathleen Norris addresses this in her book, Amazing Grace. She writes, the word righteous used to grate on my ear, she wrote. For years, I was able to hear it only in its negative mode, as self-righteous, as judgmental. Gradually, as I became more acquainted with the word in its biblical context, I found that it doesn't mean self-righteousness at all but righteousness in the sight of God. And this righteousness is consistently defined by the prophets and in the Psalms and in the Gospels as a willingness to care for the most vulnerable people in our culture, characterized in ancient Israel as orphans, widows, and aliens in the nation, resident aliens, and the poor. You know, most times... I think we are more than comfortable considering the righteousness of others. Those who sacrifice greatly for the, for the sake of others. This is why we marvel with amazement over the, the work of Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, those who have served in, in great sacrificial ways in our nation and other men and women who've committed years, years to serving others. Because by putting them, my friends, on a pedestal, our focus is on their efforts, not ours. Righteousness and sacrifice then become things of legend. Not the demands of everyday Christianity. Not the demands of everyday discipleship. Which, according to Scripture, we are perfectly capable of attaining. Jesus asks his disciples to refocus, if you will, their perceptions. To take note of those all around them. Jesus at this chronological point in Mark was deep in controversy with the religious elite of his day. In our text, we read that he condemned the scribes for devouring, for seizing widows' homes. You see, Jesus takes note of what doesn't fit in the righteous pattern of living as God would have us. And he points out the black tile the black towel, if you will, of injustice. Jesus takes note of this poor widow. He acknowledges that she's vulnerable on the bottom of society, unnoticed by those all around her, kind of destitute with no way to provide for herself, we understand in our Scripture, after the death of her husband. Jesus immediately, as he sat there, decodes the mosaic design of her culture. 
and has compassion on her as the one black tile seemingly out of place. And Jesus also takes note of those in the world whom we might often look right past. And he calls our attention to them. You see, this is the test. This is the test and the task of righteousness. To see what is not readily obvious. To test the pattern. To observe culture and address the needs of those whom we so quickly glance right over. I think Lamar Williamson makes a very important observation of Mark's gospel by noting that except for the temple discourse and the passion narrative in Mark, this is the very last scene of Jesus' public ministry in Mark. Obviously elevating the significance of the widow's sacrifice. You see, Jesus is now on the way quickly in Mark to the cross to sacrifice his life for all who would believe. And what does he do but stop and point out to his disciples his observations of this widow? Her story, though often used to raise financial support for the ministry of the church, which is important, don't get me wrong, is also also a call to take note. To observe culture. To observe others. And to seek righteousness by seeing all of God's children, especially those in need, as clearly as Christ sees them. A disciple is a person who believes in Jesus and who seeks to to live a righteous life. Thinking like Jesus. Talking like Jesus. Acting like Jesus and seeing others as Jesus sees them. But what a task it is to see others as Christ sees them. Quite a task, isn't it? I find Jesus' instruction to his disciples a demanding challenge. Jesus said, If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore. Be perfect, therefore. As your heavenly Father is perfect. Right from Jesus' own lips. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Goes right to the heart, doesn't it? Spiritual perfection is certainly inclusive of biblically understood righteousness. Righteousness that demands seeing others as children of God, along with the call for obedience to God. And what? God's word in Scripture. You see, Jesus Christ is our pattern of righteousness, which we must model in a culture, in our culture that often seeks to hide, to obscure, to ignore the black tile, the one out of place in the mosaic, the widow, the orphan, the lonely and the grieving. You know what? Even a friend who might be sitting very near to you this day person who's devastated for reasons known only to a few. A few who've been brave enough to ask. Compassionate enough to inquire. Christ-like enough to notice. To observe. You know, maybe that's the very gift that the Holy Spirit provides those who would believe. The ability to see others whom we would have never even noticed, but... By God's grace. If I love 
only those who love me. What makes me different from the angry and the divisive culture in which I live today? If I greet, if I engage socially with only those who are like me, who, who think like me, how am I a witness to the world of a different kingdom? Kingdom of heaven. No, this, this isn't easy. It isn't easy at all. Yet, I must try. I'm commanded by my conscience and my faith, and I believe Scripture, to live and to witness and love in a way that cannot take place but through a complete submission to the power of God's Holy Spirit who empowers us and makes a difference, a difference in our world today. You see, it's not you or me, but it's Christ. It's Christ in us. It's the Holy Spirit that demonstrates the righteous love of God. Jesus sat down and watched. And my friends, Jesus watches still. And he calls us to see, to see all that he sees, and then to apply his righteous love, to share his righteous love. with others. In Jesus' name, amen.